Everybody, welcome to the Frontline Club and thank you for coming tonight. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to John Lloyd, who is the uh, contributing editor to the Financial Times and the director of the journalism uh, of, of journalism at the Reuters Institute. Um, he's going to be chairing this evening's conversation. Before I do that, if I can just quickly ask you to switch your mobile phones to silent. And when you come to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, which I'll be hang handing around because um, we're streaming this evening's event live. So over to John. Thanks a lot. Uh, Osne Sayastad really does live up to the cliche. She doesn't need much introduction, which is not true of all Norwegians. But in her case, uh, she needs no introduction because she, her first book, I think it was her first book, the bookstore of Kabul sold two million copies worldwide and was, uh, w still is selling. She's written other books, uh, The Angel of Grozny, uh, which was also a big seller. Um, she has concentrated on quite detailed in analysis, quite detailed uh, investigations and portraits of people and situations. She's been working in Russia. She worked in Russia for many years, since the early 90s, when I was there as well. Uh, and then she returned to her native Norway and did this book, this book which we're discussing this evening, One of Us, uh, about the massacre now nearly four years ago by uh, a young man in his early 30s called Anders Breivik, who killed more than 70 young people at a young socialist event on an island just off Norway. So that's what we'll be speaking about. I'll be speaking with her for the next 40 minutes or so, and then it's, it's over to you for about the same amount of time. The first question, I guess, is why? You came back to Norway. You'd been in the badlands of Chechnya, very bad land. Uh, and you came back to what should be a peaceful Scandinavian society, and then you found this horror on your doorstep, as it were. Why did you feel impelled to write about it? Uh, it took, it was a long journey actually to start writing about it because this was the year of the Arab Spring. Uh, and I had a contract with the Newsweek to cover, uh, I was a part of their team to cover the Arab Springs. I was in Syria, I was in Egypt, I was in Libya, I was in the Emirates. Uh, and uh, as this happened, uh, on 22nd of July, I was in Norway. Uh, and for that reason, I think I reacted a bit like a civilian, uh, not if you can say that, use that <laughs> term, uh, not as a journalist. Um, I remember I was driving out of Oslo. Uh, in, uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and uh, we were going on an island uh, on the coast of, of Norway, southern coast of Norway. We were a group of friends who were going to have a big uh, like weekend off. So I was with two friends uh, in front seat, I was in the back seat, and then I had my two children that are one and three uh, at the time. Uh, and then uh, I got a phone co call uh, from some, no, I got an SMS saying, stay away from the city center. And of course, that's the signal for us all to put on the radio in the car and, and the ra in the car it said, uh, the, the reporter said, oh, the whole facade of the Prime Minister's building is missing. Uh, the next phone call I got was from uh, Marie Colvin uh, and she asked me, Osna, are you in Norway? And I was like, yeah, I'm in Norway. Uh, yeah, are you in Oslo? And I was like, I'm leaving Oslo. And then as this is a journalist club, I can kind of you know, draw some journalist anecdotes, but it's this feeling of uh, the journalist instinct of just telling my two friends, can you take care of my kids of not yet one and three, because I have to go back and cover this. Of course, I, couldn't, I just couldn't do that. So I just carried on to the island and said, I, I'm in Norway, but I'm, I'm not a journalist. Uh, so I never wrote anything for the Sunday Times then. Uh, but then later, I got another phone call a few days later from Tina Brown in Newsweek, who said, you know, get me anything you can on that man. <laughs> because then it was known it was not, not Al-Qaeda, it was a Norwegian citizen, and that's when I started to try to find out what happened to him, just to start a piece for Newsweek, and then I went back to Tripoli. So you were drawn into it bit by bit? 
I was drawn into it, but I just felt that Norway was, you know, I never covered Norway, so I was very, I felt very relieved when I could go back to Tripoli uh, and cover the fall of Gaddafi, and I started a book in Libya, and then only when the trial started, nine months later, I was called back, uh, and also by Newsweek to write, you know, cover the beginning of the trial, and then that's when it all started for me, actually. I mean, people who, journalists who cover war situations or areas where there is war, like Afghanistan, like Chechnya, like Russia itself, are often, often said, or even, you could say, accused of having a certain love of violence. I don't mean that they are themselves violent, so I've met, I've met some who are, but, but, um, but have a love of, of describing it, of getting some kind of buzz from it. Would you say that was true of you? Was that what you felt? Apart from the horror, was that what you felt when you heard what had happened on that island with Breivik? Uh, no, the opposite. I felt it was a feeling of deep grief. And I think I share that feeling with uh, most Norwegians. So again, as I said, I acted like a civilian, not, not really uh, like uh, you know, a cool-headed cool journalist, because we need to have a cool yes. head after all as journalists so I remember it was first the, the shock um, of that that this happened then I remember on that island I was on a different island then with these friends uh, when we got there and, and people watching the TV of these teenagers swimming and you know we saw from uh, the shots from a helicopter the one helicopter was a TV helicopter not the police helicopter um, but only the next morning when we heard the numbers of those killed uh, and we saw the pictures picture of this guy mm. uh, and some of them uh, knew who he was because he lived in their neighborhood yeah but not by name but by his face so and then very soon uh, i was actually obsessed by reading the biographies of those youngsters from the labor party youth um, not to write about them, but just like you couldn't stop you because all, you know I went into the local papers and and tried to find out. I was actually more interested by them than I was by him uh, in the beginning, uh, and that, it felt more like an act of solidarity in a way, like all these um, innocent young people who, uh, yeah. Uh, so it was. Um, I don't think I, I remember when. I, Tina Brown uh, asked me about the first Newsweek story and I asked her, well, do you also want stories about the uh, victims? And she said, no, 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 I think we've had enough of that. And I was like, so really? Because one thing is to, after a, let's say, a massacre in Baghdad or a bomb that's exploded, you can go to the neighborhood and you can knock on some doors and ask, is there, has anyone been killed here? Do you know anyone who has been killed? But it was actually, I realized, it was almost impossible for me to do the same thing in Norway at that point, because so it was freshly society. after. Because it was Probably. I would have felt, I felt so much like an intruder. I didn't yeah. have to do it because Newsweek wasn't yeah. interested in the victims at the time. So um, I, I didn't have to do it. And I, I was like, yeah, because it would have felt like next to impossible to do it. I should have explained at the beginning that the book is about an incident which I, many of you will remember. It was only three or four years ago, which was that a man called Anders Breivik, who had this, this festering within him for years and had spent two or three years essentially in his bedroom playing war games uh, and had become attached to very far right websites, then uh, made this decision that he had to kill the next generation of politicians. And politicians in Norway tend to be social democratic on the left in this camp where young socialists go every year on the island, he then, Utoya, Utoya? Utoya. Uh, Utoya, where, which, um, uh, and he then went over there, armed to the teeth, which he'd carefully prepared, and shot 76, 77? 69 on the island, and yeah. eight were eight killed in, in the in, bombing in, in, in the government in area. Yeah. Uh, and was then quite quickly apprehended and put on trial, which is in all, all in, in, the, in the book. Your, your, your title is One of Us, which in the UK recalls Mrs. Thatcher, uh, who said off 
people in the cabinet when she first joined, when she first was prime minister, he or she is not one of us. In your case, it means that, uh, that Breivik sprang from, I guess, from <laughs> Norwegian society. Yet it also seems from your narrative that he was not quite of Norwegian society. He was part of another society, a society you could say off the net. He was off the net and off a, an ideology which was common, perhaps more common in the United States, to a degree the UK, France, really everywhere, certainly in Russia. Extreme right-wing ideology which saw Muslims, in his case and many others' case, as being the who was swamping Russia, uh, swamping Europe, and he saw that very strongly, that he was a knight errant with a sword which would stop the Muslims coming. And uh, So he wasn't one of us in that sense. He was, of course, Norwegian, but he was also one of a global sense that the world was, that the, the, the Christian world, as it had been the white world, if you will, was being submerged by this tide of Islam, this tide of immigrants. He was both, wasn't he? Yeah, and I think it's uh, important whether you look at uh, him or if you'd look, if you've written now about the young jihadist, I think it's important to uh, try to find out wh where it all comes from. Yes. Because at some point, at least he was one of us, uh, the young jihadist to go against their own society just as he went against his own society at some point they were also you know part of us they went to the same schools and then they make a decision to go against it mm. and then are they still part of us or are they not mm. but also the title actually plays on uh, it was supposed to play on um, to tr I struggled hard to find a title that would talk about both him and the victims mm. Uh, probably this feels, uh, I remember my father said that, oh no, don't use that title, it's too provocative, because he also thought that it was solely on him. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, also like you have, you see the victims, like um, for instance, this boy Simon from a little fishing village in, Oslo, uh, in, in the northern part of Norway, he's the typical Norwegian boy in a way, he's definitely like one of us, nobody would question him being typical teenager from uh, above the polar circle. And then you have a young girl, Bano, who is a Kurdish refugee coming as a toddler to Norway and uh, having met racism and, uh, and in, in her primary school years. Uh, I really, that also amazed me when I went through the story, like how much uh, she was met with this, you know, uh, this is a game for those who speak Norwegian or this is a game for those who uh, are Norwegians or... Mm. But anyway, she uh, fights her way, she becomes a member of the Labour Party and she is uh, fighting against climate change and for integration and for women's rights and, and all these core mm. Norwegian issues in a way among the youth. And she also spends like all her summer salary in a summer job he, she has, she spends it on a national costume, a uh, Norwegian uh, bunad, which is used for the national day. And just a little story about her, that um, on the, when the 17th of May appears, uh, she's been trying this national costume on and off, on and off for weeks, because she's finally, she has like the symbol of being Norwegian. And the, when the morning uh, comes, she comes up with a different dress and the parents ask her, where's your national costume? And she says, she's been laying, lying awake all night. She says, I don't have the right to wear it because I didn't in inherit it. You, you can't buy these things online. You have to inherit it from the grandmother and, or, or something. And then the father says, that, OK, if anyone asks you about your costume, you should just say that, um, that uh, you know, you're Grand, uh, grand, grand, grandmother was was uh, was kidnapped by a by a Viking who had <laughs> come to Baghdad, it did and happen. to avoid uh, yeah to avoid honor killing, uh, she <laughs> happened to 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 live in in Tirisil in Norway, from. So it's like this girl, uh, her highest dream was to become one of us. It was to become yeah. Norwegian. It was to 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 like fit into the Norwegian society. 
and she's one of those we, we lost on the uh, on the island uh, in addition to Simon and so it's like it was to try to find a title that can encompass all of them and also speak about the Norwegian society because it's also a book about modern day Norway in a way mm. uh, and then uh, it's um, I think it's important not to portray Anders Breivik as, as something alien. Uh, I think evil, being evil is being human. That's the, that's the sad truth. Like when people say, oh, he was inhuman, he was a monster, all these things. But when you look at history, being evil, it's part of being, uh, you know, uh, human, unfortunately. So it's, it's, um, we, it's, it's wrong of us if we say, what well, he's sick, we're healthy. No, they're, they're what made him, uh, how was it possible? I think it's, uh, I think he, he was one of us. And whether he's still one of us, that's a different question, of course. Well, it's one that I'd like to come on to, but, uh, but there's uh, the, the also famous Norwegian author, the novelist Nausgaard, who's written about, about this case and you in The New Yorker recently. Um, he, he said that, that drawing from what you had written, that, that what Breivik had not done was he'd, he'd not been able to see the other in us, to use the other in us, and that most of us at some level, even if it's fairly see the other in us, that, that, that we have some kind of empathy that, you know, uh, a bit like Shylock's speech in Merchant of Venice, if, if they prick us, do we not bleed? He bleeds, prick, prick him, I also bleed. So that we have some, but, but for some reason, which probably, I guess, tormented you a bit because it remains a mystery, that didn't happen or ceased to happen with Breivik. At some point, he didn't see anyone else as him, that the other was, was, could be wholly objectified as an enemy who had to be Unfortunately, there you go, uh, hard luck, but it had to be done. We, did you feel that as a mystery, something you couldn't quite get at? Well, I think that um, you have to go into his world. And in his world view, he's at war. Mm. And when he, um, how to say, how, when he <coughs> turns his brain into being at war, having a mission, there is no pity because these are not civilians, these are the enemy. Yeah. And I think he uses the exact same methods as, do you think the guys in ISIS, do they see the other in the person they kill? I don't think they do. Yeah. Or in the people they behead. Of course, there are exceptions, but I think most of them <laughs> don't. Did the Nazis in Ukraine or in Belarus, in, in those most terrible massacres that happened, or in Auschwitz, did they see the other in the person they killed? I don't think they did. Just to, just to insert in, in this though, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. However, they were, there was a group of them. In the Nazis' case, yeah. there were millions of them. Mm. He was himself. Mm, but he, I think the only explanation that I can find is that he made his brain into this being at war. <laughs> and whenever, uh, whenever uh, these youngsters were talked about in the trial, if someone used, uh, or uh, like, um, like actually, just one hour after, because I, I was, got access to all the police records of these interrogations, uh, and when the police talks about this use as civilians or like you know murders, he's like, this is not murders. This is uh, executions of the enemy. So every time it's like it comes in as a, is is on an autopilot almost. Like yeah. he corrects them. No, no, no. They're not civilians. They're the enemy. Uh, but even for him, um, because even for a soldier, killing uh, until you got off some barrier, it's difficult. Mm. And for him, he was um, he had medicated himself with uh, what he called an, a cocktail of ephedrine, aspirin, and caffeine, uh, and he'd been going on on hormones for a while. So to um, yeah to, to take off some emotions, but he's, he's in his own words. He's also telling about how difficult it was to kill, um, and what he says. One thing is, and that's also what shows that he might be sane and not insane. The fact that he had a choice, he knew he had a choice, he knew he didn't have to do it. So there's a very decisive moment 
just before he drives up to the government building and explodes the van. He stops for two minutes, and this is all on the police records. Like, he stopped there, and what did he do two minutes? Mm -hmm. And according to his own words, he had stopped the car, and he was thinking, I don't have to do it. I can just drive past. I can just take another road. I don't have to explode it. I can just, you know. And then, no, he does it. He lights the fu uh, fuse, and he, he leaves. And the moment, that's his own words, and then the moment when he gets off the ferry, he has manipulated his way in, as dressed as a policeman, fooling everyone, says he's going to inform the youth about the bomb in Oslo. So he gets off the ferry and he feels it's impossible. His plan is impossible. He won't be able to kill anyone. Uh, so he's met on the island, a woman and two guards, and they are former policemen. And they start just asking him, so where do you want to meet the youngsters? Where do you, how, do we, how are we going to organize it? But they also ask him questions about what unit are you from? And, and then he feels like mm, he doesn't have the right police terminology, that they are, he feels trapped. He feels that they, if I don't do anything now, they are going they're to, gonna me, yeah. they're going to get me. Mm -hmm. But he also says that many times, 100 voices in my head were screaming, no, 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 don't do it, you don't have to do it. Uh, and he tells about how it was almost physical impossible, but at some point he has his hand on his thigh, he takes up the pistol and he points it at a guard and this woman camp leader screams, don't point the gun at him. He shoots, he shoots her, he shoots the other and then it was all easy. Yeah. Then it was like a barrier was lifted. No more concerns ever. He shows no emotions. It was, uh, uh, he's, he, he, that's how he explains it. Like yeah. something was lifted. It so was all easy. So he entered easy. into another state, another mental state. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that, uh, that you describe uh, in, uh, I have to say, a brilliantly reported book is um, the, the the, the response of the, the Norwegian security services and the, and the police, as you say, there had been a bomb gone off in the government district, as though, in our case, it had been exploded outside 10 Downing Street on, in Whitehall. Uh, uh, it's a kind of almost tragic comic. It's like a, a terrible tragedy is unfolding, and underneath it, there's Keystone Cops. There's, there's, the, the, there's people who don't answer the phone, there are systems which have been, have been put in place but don't work. The, the, the policemen are late. The cars don't work. When they go to the island, they can't find a boat. I mean, it's all just, you know, you, I suppose we Brits expect Scandinavians to be always efficient. <laughs> <laughs> this was hugely inefficient. Whether or not it actually increased the tragedy, if they'd got there earlier, could they have stopped it, is a really an open question. But that must have shocked you, or, 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 and, and presumably once you'd published it or others, other journalists had said it, it shocked Norwegian society, or, or did it not? Uh, it shocked definitely, and mm -hmm. uh, the tragedy is like Norway acted as a failed state that day, mm -hmm. and these are terms we would use for Somalia and you know, countries mm -hmm. that don't work. It was a no response in the first hour, yeah. the important hour. Uh, and uh, it's definitely something wrong in the police culture in Norway uh, because it was not like one mistake by one or two or three or five policemen. It was a, maybe the like you, yeah, maybe, but it, together 20, 30, 40 mis individual mistakes. Mm. Uh, and then the leadership, first <coughs> of all, like when the, as you said, there's a bomb exploding outside the government area, uh, government building. Uh, after a minute, uh, they see it's a car bomb, meaning terror. It's not a gas leakage or anything. Nobody touches like the red bottom terror bottom that exists. We ha we have had the police had terror training, and if they'd like touched on the let's say it's, it sounds easy with the red button, but it's like the certain things that then will happen. Uh, roads will be blocked out of Oslo. Observation posts will be put on certain places, the exact places where he was driving. Uh, and the, the very one very tragic thing is like there was a call in uh, just after the explosions who had seen Breivik, who described him uh, dressed as a policeman, pistol in hand, going from the bomb area into 
van driving out against the uh, driving out uh, and he says he there was something weird about him so I took the number here you have the number and the operator who takes that message uh, simultaneously is looking at the pictures and sees this is the same guy this matches with the pictures mm -hmm. she sees understands this is important this is must be you know this must be linked <laughs> she writes on a yellow post-it note goes to her boss of course it's chaotic room um, and she gets as she says later to this commission who does the research afterwards or them she gets the impression that the boss sees the notes she puts it on the desk and takes more calls and the note just sits there on the desk disturbs nobody while Anders Breivik is driving slowly out of Oslo there's queues yeah, yeah. He's going on to the opera tunnel under the Oslo Fjord, uh, and he's sitting there and he thinks like, I'm going to be, of course, they've, they've closed all get... roads, I won't be able to leave. Uh -oh. On the western side of Oslo, drive slowly uh, by the American embassy, which is of course swarming with security personnel. And the desk is still sitting there on the desk. And the note is, the, the, the note is sitting on the desk half an hour later someone sees it and they call up the, the guy. Are you the one? Did you just leave a note? There's a car number here. And still after that, they don't have enough information. To, one thing is to give it over radio to the public, but yeah. not even to give it to, to the police. So it's all these messages that are not being sent out. Um, even as the... the, the, the um, the what do you call the emergency emergency units that are sent finally uh, they're not being told that he's dressed like a policeman mm. so it's all this uh it's it's really you you don't believe it when you read it how many mistakes is possible to do so in a well-functioning country as you said had there not been these mistakes then he might have been stopped he think. might have been stopped mm. before getting to before the, getting island. the island yeah. and that is of course the bitterness yeah. for the parents yeah, yeah. the, the sisters and brothers uh, that and also the police hasn't really um, how to acknowledge their mistakes. Not really. It's like you say, the, like politicians, you're able to say I'm sorry in a way that you're not really sorry. So that is, uh, you know, that's an open wound, definitely. Yeah, it must be. Just two more questions before we go over to the uh, to the uh, to the audience. You write about um, Breivik in jail. I mean, of course, he was sentenced. He was sentenced to the maximum, which is 20 years, I think, which could be then extended there's no death sentence there's no uh, there's no um prison for life although it can yeah. be extended for life yeah. um, but you write of him and others have written about him as well since he's been in jail in this way which which almost makes the blood boil uh he uh, he complains he complains about the way in which he's treated he complains most of all in that he he wants to write a manifesto to rouse the people of, uh, of Europe against uh, the, the Muslim hordes. And they give him a pen, which presumably is just a cheap biro, and he says, this pen isn't ergonomic. It, uh, it, it makes my hand sore because I write so much. This is torture, he says. This is torture. And you think, after you've done that, how can you? So the, 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 it's kind of a, a narcissism of a kind which is <laughs> unbelievable. Mm. How, what, what did you make of that when you described him both in the trial, when he was wholly without effect, it seems, and after? Mm. I think narcissism is the word, and mm. that's the only diagnosis he got out from, even though he mm. got out with no diagnosis in a way, but only that he had narcissistic traits. Yeah. But the pen definitely, and it's, it's, it's a soft pen so that he can't hurt himself. Mm -hmm. So there's like, there's something wrong with that pen. But also, like, uh, some examples, just to, like, um, after the, <coughs> just with the, when the police has, has caught him on the island. They interrogate him on the island because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to move him from there, where there's still bodies around when the police arrives. They're, you know, the bodies are still around. They're not being moved during that night. They're injured people, and they take him to question him in this, uh, this house. Uh, and then... One of the first things he says is, 
you can't imagine how hard this has been for me. This has been the toughest day of my life and I hope none of you will ever experience this because it was so difficult. So he starts, in a, he thinks about himself. His sole, per, his sole um, thoughts are how he has suffered. Inside, yeah. It was actually quite tough. Yeah, yeah. And then it's this, uh, he has <coughs> this uh, wound in his finger. When suddenly he realized, he asked for coke, he asked for sodas, uh, food, and then he realizes he's bleeding on his finger. This is all in the police documents. Uh, and he asked for a Band-Aid. And first there's a policeman who says, you, you're getting no fucking Band-Aid from me. <laughs> and then he's like, I'm, I've already lost half a liter of blood. I need the Band-Aid. And then, of course, they, they, uh, for, the, for the police interrogators, I mean, we now know this was the end, but their main concern, this is a person, he's done the government area, he's done this, what's next? So, of course, they give him the band-aid to continue. And then he's like still wondering about, you know, I wonder wh where I got this, um, where I got this, uh, when I started bleeding. And then he's like, oh, I remember. And then he remembers some shooting someone in the head and something hit back at him. And then he says, oh, it must have been a or something. Bone, yeah. It really hurts me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, documented as being five millimeter deep, this wound. So it's like all the time, it, that was his main concern. And also in trial, uh, just like last example about his narcissism, just to say it in, in <laughs> examples instead of uh, analyzes. So all through the trial, all through, all, when we go through the victims, the all, people who, who tell about how they lost their best friend holding her hand, you know, the 17, the two 17 year olds, mm -hmm. girl is coming, she, how she hold the hand. They both hit, they all both shot in the head, one survives and can tell the story. Uh, and how she feels that the 17 year old friend is losing her grip. All these things, all the plans they had and everything. And then he's just totally cold. And that, that at some point they're showing uh, a film that is made just the compilation of things from the internet about uh, anti-jihadist kind of uh, from those sides. And then he sits crying and starts, and we're like, he's crying. First time, he's all face, all red, crying, crying, crying. And then uh, that's because he saw his own film and he has one deep love in his life and that's for himself. Yeah. In your book, this is the last point, uh, your book uh, on the Angel of Grozny, you have a character called Timur, who's a, a kid who's lost his parents, who's in an orphanage, pretty lousy place, and talks about the badness in himself. I remember that from reading it uh, before. The badness in himself, because he's seen so much and he's ingested, as he thinks, the badness. Uh, and I was thinking of that when I read the Breivik book, that the badness in this kid who really had, you know, was, was brought up in horror. And was not brought up in horror. To be sure, he had a bad childhood. His, his father left him, his mother was kind of indifferent and, and a bit zany. But, you know, people survive that and are okay. Uh, where, you must have asked yourself, I guess, where did the badness come from? Yeah. I mean, one could say bad childhood, yeah. father left and so on. but. This was so extreme that mm. it, it seemed to be almost something else. You almost were forced into some kind of diabolic uh, um, rationale. Mm. What, what did you think of that? Uh, I don't have the answer uh, to that, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't draw any conclusions in the book. It's mm. all just trying to write out what, yes. what's there, so I can sit now and draw conclusions. But, but. Um, I think if I'd met him and if I if I'd had one to ask him, uh, it would have been that, mm. you know, why, right. like, and, and mm. where did it all come from and all that. But I think there, there was someone who drew the, just a, um, a parallel to the perfect storm that needs, you know, the, the certain kind of temperature, certain kind of speed, certain kind of humidity, certain kind of season, and then at the becomes this uh, tornado or something that had it, if you taken out one factor, one degree, uh, one uh, something, mm. it wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have happened yeah. So I think for Breivik, I think, uh, I think there's a, somehow there's a, 
these factors all together is like not one dramatic answer, but it's the factors of some genetic disposition. The childhood that is kind of more than bad because it's so um, it's on and off. So he's uh, it's love hate, love hate, love hate. So he 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 doesn't build up uh, the person. That, he doesn't build up his own self, um, and it goes to the. Um, the building of empathy when, when he's always turned off by the mother and then turned on and turned off and turned on. Um, so he's a very confused child. And then this very confused child goes into the world and tries to find a place to belong because he has no place to belong and he has no place to feel secure. He goes out in the world and there's one explanation that one of his, uh, the teenage uh, classmates says, uh, oh, he was trying so hard so he was so uncool. So if we stuck to him, we will all also become uncool. So that is one of the tragic, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how to say, patterns of his life. He's trying to find a place to belong, and he's rejected, and he's rejected, and he's rejected. And in the very end, he's rejected by the far right uh, and the anti-jihadist sites. And then, just to finalize, then this is like, because he was... He wants to be noticed and read and admired. So he writes this book that he calls the Manifesto, and he sends it out to this uh, on the sites to the you know the big guys on the sites. Nobody responds. Nobody answers. Nobody's interested. And he's then thinking, uh, and this is the last two years before. He's thinking, what can I do to be read? I need to do something dramatic. And then he calculates, and this is his own words, like, how many people do I have to kill to be noticed? And he comes to like 11, 12, somewhere there, 12, I'll be noticed worldwide. He ends up killing 77, and he calls that day, and the massacre in Utøya, he calls it his book launch, because it will make him being read. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, this is the kind of person we're dealing with. Thanks very much. You are, your descriptions of what happened on the island, which are almost unbearable, because you reconstruct what happened when he met these, these young kids and shot them at point black range, are uh, reportage, which, is, which really does almost get to the limits of, of, of readability. But, uh, but the book is extraordinary, and you are a great ornament of our trade. Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's, it's a very fine piece of reportage. Over to you, please. Could you say where you are when you... When you're, yeah. you. Um, hi, I'm Hadani Ditmars. I'm a Canadian journalist. I wrote a book on Iraq called Dancing in the No-Fly Zone. So um, what struck me listening to you speaking now was, of course, we had our own um, attack on the Canadian Parliament. I don't know if you followed that at all or if there was any sense of frisson or deja vu there. Um, one person was killed, a soldier, um, but again there were a lot of flaws in the system, uh, as you said, stone cops mistakes. Uh, in the end he did enter into the parliament building and shot, you know, uh, some fired some shots but he was killed by the sergeant at arms. Anyway. Um, Recently, um, there's been some fairly draconian anti-terror legislation passed in Canada. Um, you know, even Canadians have more chance of dying of food poisoning than of a terrorist attack. And the quote-unquote terror attacks were perpetrated by mentally ill French Canadian men, uh, not by Muslims or Arabs, etc. But I'm struck by the fact that, that Norway, if I'm correct, has not responded to this tragedy by um, uh, you know, draconian um, measures that uh, limit civil liberties, etc. So I, I just wondered, first of all, if you could comment on a resonance between the two situations and uh, the two different reactions of the government, of the mm. two different governments. Well, I can comment on the Norwegian case. Um, I think that uh, in Norway um, there is um, We've always been a very open society. With uh, we're close to the rulers. We we should be. You know, they, they were, uh, it's an easy access to those who are uh, uh, in charge. And I had an interview with uh, pr then Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg, who is now Secretary General of NATO. 
Uh, and I asked about this exact question about security measure, what will happen now? And he said that, um, you know, if we built um, barriers and big walls against all our uh, institutions, terrorists will just go to softer targets. So it's, it's like we can't be terrorism in building high walls. Um, I think what has happened in Norway, yes, there are probably a few more barriers and they are, uh, you can't just go straight into the, I mean, now the government area is closed, but it's like you can't any longer just go through it like you could before. It was the quickest way it was to go through the building, not around it. Uh, so, but I think also like he is, uh, now we have a more conservative government, but I think still that he touched a, uh, a chord with the Norwegian sentiment that we actually, if we changed all our society because of this one man, wouldn't that have been a defeat too? Uh, because um, yes, one thing is the police response. That's one thing and that must be better. And they have gotten more funding, but of course we don't know if that actually works until there's a new attack. So it's, it's like uh, there hasn't been a new test to the system. But I think now also happening in Norway, not linked to Breivik at all, but it's happening linked to the threat of Islamic terrorism, uh, a heightened alert. Uh, now Norwegian police is, uh, there's a test, uh, there's a, like a trying period for them to be armed, uh, which they've never been before, which is probably going to be more a permanent solution. So it's a, there is, uh, there is a trend of uh, society become more uh, armed and more protected but I think not so much because of Revik, but because of uh, the international threat. That's uh, that's how what I how I read the 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 reports from the security part of the police and the government. Who's next? Mm. Slightly two parts, but on the same theme. One, did you try and meet him? Sorry, did you did you try to meet him? And they said you can't. Uh, he or said, he said. He said. Um, so I was uh, when the trial was over and he was judged sane. I was thinking, okay, so then I should interview him. If he had been judged, it would been a different uh, matter. Uh, and then uh, I asked the lawyer, how do you organize an interview with him? And, and he said, well, you know, the lawyer couldn't organize it, but write him a letter. He said, I wrote him a letter about the book and uh, what I wanted to ask him about. And I got no response um, until a year had passed. There was a letter in my mailbox, uh, which was uh, a letter that probably very, um, it's probably very matches his character. It's very like his manifesto, cut and paste, and very confused and like uh, uh, he contradicts himself in this big manifesto that he wrote. So he starts like uh, with a lot of flattering, like uh, how he admires me and so on, and then he. Uh, strikes and say, but I see you as a predator and I, uh, you know, you're going to hit me harder than anyone else. So I don't want to see or have anything to do with your book, but let's, let's uh, cooperate. Let's write the book together. So he's like on like this. Uh, and then he's even like, you can write the middle part and I'll write the start and the end. <laughs> and yeah. And then, uh, and then only if this book comes out successfully, then he would give an interview. So only after. So then I wrote back to say this is not possible, but I'm still interested in the in. I just had to make that clear that's not possible, but I still am interested in the interview. And then he was like more, much more cold, dear Miss uh, Sarstad. Uh, you know, I uh, he wrote that more pol more of the political thing that you, I was not so much interested in his politics because he'd said that we know that it's the anti-jihadist. It's the same. You read Robert Spencer, Pamela Geller, or Fjordman, these guys, it's, not, it's nothing new. It, his politics is nothing new by himself. But, um, uh, but um, yeah, so, so he wrote more of that. And then, um, uh, so he didn't, he didn't want to give an interview. He hasn't given an interview. He's afraid of difficult questions, I think. Is there, is there a debate in Norway about <coughs> um, what happens to him? Is it conceivable that Anders Breivik is ever a free man in Norway? Do, are, do people talk about that yet? People, lawyers have talked about it 
and I think too early because with no respect to the victims um, like do we have to have a, a print a debate on principles today when people are still afraid of him coming after them uh, whether uh, is it right one day whether he should be out you know anyway first of all he has to serve his 21 years and then in the Norwegian law um, if you are a danger to society you can be kept indefinitely, as you said, but it has to be a new hearing every five years. So every five years there will be a hearing. And I think, what I know from him, um, him saying, he was asked, is there anything you regret? He was asked by the prosecutor. And he said, I only regret one thing, is that I didn't kill more people. So he's not done, and with the manipulative character that he has, even though he would say, I really regret, let's say in 30 years, I want to come back to society, I think he can never be trusted. He's just, uh, the way uh, he killed these teenagers, uh, the way he would say, the police is here, there's a boat for you coming, you gather, you know, go stand in line, you know, crowd to crowd to crowd. The ability to just lie people in their faces you know i think he will always be dangerous and for that reason uh, he can never be let out even though when, uh, it, now he's 36 he was 32 when it happened <laughs> he keeps himself fit he can live another in 40 years he's 76 he's still dangerous in 60 years he's 96 well maybe <laughs> yeah when he becomes too weak but yeah i think he will die in prison Hi there. Could you talk a little bit about the debate over um, his sanity during the trial? If I understand, there were several conflicting reports um, and quite a lot of debate, at least in the international press, about whether or not he should be given that classification. Mm. Yes, I think... Um, <laughs> okay, so... The first couple of psychiatrists who uh, was uh, going to... Uh, write the report about uh, their view, whether he's sane or insane, they, I think they never should have been appointed. I think uh, they kind of destroyed the case. They were very emotional and so many, uh, they got so many exceptions. For instance, they said, we're not, um, they're going to see, even if it's a couple, they're going to see him one by one. That's the rules. But they said, we're too emotional touched by this so we have to do it together so first mistake um, second mistake was that they had to um, uh, what was that they um, how to say they everything he did everything he said um, or to give you an example again so let's say uh, to, to be, be in, in, in Norway um, psychosis it what is the dividing if you have, if you're under psychosis, you will be insane. If you don't have psychosis, you're sane. And to be psychotic, uh, according to the court psychiatrist, you have to, um, you know, you have to, how to say, you have to, uh, you have to cross off for certain things. Uh, and what they found, like he was just psychotic. But for instance, wh what made him psychotic is like, you know, if you're psychotic, you've Invent your own words. It's called neologisms in, in this uh, psychiatric language. Um, he'd used the, you know, he used the words of national Darwinist, social Darwinist, culture, mul uh, multiculturalist, all these, these terms that they said, oh, he's psychotic. These words do not exist. And if they just Googled them, they would have realized those words are all out there. He didn't invent them. Uh, and the other thing was when he said that um, he was the master of life and death. Um, and they said, it's not possible to be master of life and death, psychotic. Whereas that is what terrorism is about, uh, as the judge, uh, judge uh, put to those psychiatrists. Um, and other things were uh, that now more cool-headed, we can see you know, how emotional it is they were about it. They just, they couldn't believe it was possible, so they put him in the basket of, of uh, psychosis. So there were 37 different experts uh, who, who studied him. 
35, no, 34 did not find a sign of psychosis. Those two first ones did. One was uncertain. So why I say this was a tragedy for the case is that the whole trial was about his brain instead of being about his crime. Instead of giving us the possibility to discuss more the political aspects, which I think it, uh, we shouldn't forget, this would not have been possible without the political context. Without him feeling he had you know, the support from some, you know, some others, from a group, from a party, uh, from the, the, those sides of the internet. So I think uh, the court didn't really um, discuss his crime, but all those small details about sane or insane, sane or insane, ended up being sane, that's what he wanted, but, but those, that very first report, I, that was given, I think, too much weight. It is, a, I mean, it is that's one of the, the core fascinating things about this, that when you, you mentioned the Nazis, and so you had a movement, and ultimately a movement which brought in tens of thousands of activists and militants and adherents, who, who it seems from reading about it, sincerely believed that if they got rid of the Untermenschen, the, the Jews, the Gypsies, the Slavs, and so on, then they would create a great society, a much, much better society, of course, for themselves, but also for the world. And yet they were judged and hanged, uh, some of them, um, as though they were sane. And they were sane, but they were also, they were also mad. I mm. mean, they... So, and the same is true of Breivik, although, mm. as we were saying earlier, he's only one. You have a, a kind of disjunction between the sanity of the preparation and the care and indeed the identification of a goal stop these people bringing in this hordes of people who destroy my society and the horror and the madness of the of 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 what he was doing uh, it, it 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 almost brings in a different kind of definition of madness mm. not schizophrenia mm. not psychosis but a kind of a a, 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 a madness of, as we were saying earlier, of, of um, uh, thinking only one, of oneself, of narcissism, but also of final ends. You know, if you have a final end extinction of a people, uh, or in his case, an extinction of, a, of a, a governing class, isn't that madness? That must have occurred. He's ravingly mad. He's insane. You know, in that, in the colossus. Yeah. But according to the court, is like, is he responsible for his crime? He's responsible, of course. Yeah. yeah. Is he? Uh, can he be judged? And I, in that, as I agree with the judge, as you understood, <laughs> um, that uh, he knew what he was doing. He knew, it, and he he didn't have to do it by you know yes. like under psychosis where people are don't really uh, right. are masters of themselves. As you said, he, I mean, in, when he was in the government district, it was touch and go. He could have said, oh, forget it. Yeah, and he did, he he did think that. He did. Yeah, yeah. But he decided, no, I, oh, I spent all my... He was even thinking about because he'd spent... He had no future then. He'd spent... In order to build the bomb, he had um, uh, taken up loans from different banks. He had 10 credit cards yeah. where th that he was using to the limit. So he had no way back. And his main, like five years earlier, his main concern was to get rich. And he was rich at some point. He was a Norwegian millionaire, which is, uh, yeah, I don't know what that's in pounds, but, but he, he was quite rich and successful. Mm -hmm. Then he lost it and then he regained it. So it's like, had he been rich, there's also this, all these things that, had he just been rich, he wouldn't have gone yeah. to the <laughs> island. Had he, uh, could have been you in know, Har he could have been in Harrods even now. <laughs> yeah, shopping. So it's like he, for him, he had no more future. He, yeah. yeah. So, <coughs> so I, I have a question. Um, do you think that uh, there's any similarities between and the young jihadists who go to Syria? How they look at life? How they, how, how they look at the world? And do you think that what he did actually? Hardened, hardened people in Norway. They became more right wing. That uh, that this because there are people who, are, who feel by the increase in in, 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 in society, in a multicultural society, multi ethnic society, the the increase in the numbers of Muslims in in, in, in Europe. In Europe. But that what he actually did 
Mm. Well, I think there are mm, striking similarities between between him and the jihadists in many ways, and ISIS would have be his dream army. He was in his manifesto. He's he's writing about that army that will help him to cleanse Europe of Muslim, and just that word cleansing. That's what ISIS is doing. Um, so it's it's like um, the similarities are in this idea of supremacy that we are above the others. Uh, ISIS as uh, Sunni Muslims, him as as a white Christian man, uh, and how we can like his goal is to. Um, not just stop immigration, but to rid Europe of Muslims. Those who do not go, uh, like uh, uh, those who don't go uh, voluntarily, will either have to convert uh, or uh, be deported or get killed. Uh, if you convert, you have to change your name to a Christian name. Uh, it's all this. He's making this system of yeah, you have to change your name. Um, if you're a Muslim a pre, a former Muslim couple are not able to have more than two children, they're not able to be in contact with Muslims in other countries. He, all, he sets up all these sets of, of uh, rules that are in some instance, sim and the patriarchy, of course, women should uh, obey, uh, men should rule. So it's all this, um, he's making his own, he doesn't call it the caliphate, but he's on a crusade, just as they're on a crusade. Uh, and it's also this, um, yeah, um, of the other being an enemy that j only deserved to be killed. Uh, so his massacre, uh, it's, it can only be compared to the massacre. They are more and they are able to get more people. Uh, but I think they're, they're very, very similar and they are also uh, each other's uh, perfect enemies. Uh, the way that who do Breivik see as the Muslim that he is afraid of, it's kind of Muslim. Uh, and who do they see as their enemy? Well, it's, it would be someone like him who, who do not accept um, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims in their countries, who would not accept. Like Also another similarity, uh, he wanted to, and he writes that all traces of Islam must be eradicated from Europe. All mosques must be demolished. Uh, demolished. All uh, Islamic sites, even if it has an ant antique value, uh, must be demolished. Just like we might now see happening in Palmyra. So it's um, there are each other's uh, definitely uh, yeah. mirror uh, um, of each other. Uh, whether it's led Norway into a more right wing, um, I don't. It's early to tell, but uh, there's there's there is a growth in Europe. There is a trend of extremism. Like you have more people joining extremist movement. Like you have, you know, one thing is Pegida movement in Germany. It doesn't have great numbers in 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 Norway, uh, and I think that we can see him uh, more like a European character than as a Norwegian. Maybe it's just like me having to say that as a Norwegian. But I mean it, I think that he could have appeared in any Nor European country. Uh, Norway has uh, half the number of Muslims than is the average of Europe. We have 3%, Europe has an average of 6%. So th there's, no, uh, there's no objective reason why he should have like this anger against uh, the flooding of Muslims into Norway. So, so I think it's like that character. He could have appeared in Belgium, uh, Netherlands, or in the UK. Uh, and uh, but he's as he. One of the things in his lies that we discussed prior that somehow he's not as opposed to Hitler. He's not able to inspire. That's one of the tragedies of his life. He's, he never he never gets the position in the party he wants, or the position in the graffiti community, or he gets rich. He doesn't get, even in the internet gaming society, he doesn't succeed. He's not able to inspire. And I think from now, he's, when you look at, I'm following, and other scholars are following, like, there is not a big, you know, fan club of Breivik, or that he's inspired others. So, uh, uh, I, I, no, I think, up to now, the answer is no. He's, he's, he, he hasn't led to a more far-right Norway. You're next. 
Yes, could you expand on <coughs> could you expand on the influence of uh, you know Pamela Geller, uh, Robert Spencer, and the other hate mongers? Uh, you know, uh, what is surprising about these people is that they project all this hatred without many consequences or any consequence. And uh, I guess uh, it also points to uh, people reading that and thinking that they can get a version of hatred. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, these people have a huge influence on Breivik. They are his uh, uh And um, so it's these sites, if you want to look in, into them, it's... Um, it's uh, anti-jihadist sites, that's like the term uh, we've used, anti-Islamic sites. And the, the ingredients of their ideology, it's uh, the same as Breivik, except from the, you know, they don't construct uh, imaginary armies or imaginary, you know, they don't set up these rules of, you know, Muslims, former Muslims will not, you know, and, and get children more than two. That that is kind of his own in his manifesto, the part three. But the first, he has th the manifesto of 1,500 pages, three parts. The first and the second part is a blueprint of their sites. And even, I think he quotes Robert Spencer like 117 times or something. Uh, and then his other uh, main leading star is Norwegian ideologue called Fjordman, um, who is... Um, also writing on these sites, so it's definitely that is um, they are so-called, you know, non-violent because they don't say what you can say is Breivik's logical conclusion about if you want to get rid of Muslims in Europe, so they're not going to go by themselves. Uh, you have to use violence, uh, and so he just draws the next. He just goes the next step, but all the ingredients he found uh, on the net. So I think I would hold them, I wouldn't hold them responsible for the massacre, but I would hold them responsible for inspiring him and, and, and making him believe that what he did uh, would, uh, that it had followers. Because on the internet, those sites, you know, it works as an echo chamber, whatever you put in, it gets amplified back. So at some point he believes that he has a following that he, he doesn't really have. That, that, I mean, that's, that suggests another book, really. Uh, maybe it's been written and I haven't read it, but, but that how far, if you put out there some kind of ideology, some kind of idea, it doesn't have to be malign, it could be benign, how far the, the actually then creates a movement of sorts. It, we know it does create sort of movements, um, but how far then is it open to and actually being used better by malign movements, extremist movements? How far is it, is it the kind of place where someone like Brevik can thrive, which he couldn't before? Mm. Yes, um, formerly they had to meet up and uh, yeah. find each other. But on the other hand, um, on the other hand they did meet he up. didn't, yeah, and he didn't really uh, make it even on the internet. No. Uh, but of course, it is a way that these uh, these um, extremists uh, meet yeah. uh, and uh, recruit each other. Uh, and, of, and you could uh, also ask the same question as you pose, like, okay, what about the extreme Salafi movements that are non-violent? Yeah. Non are they responsible for, for the jihadists going? Mm -hmm. If you might say they share the total same ideology and the same ingredients, and then only some of them jump. Uh, so who, those organizations that are peaceful but extreme, are they responsible, are they not? It's a, very, it's a very good question because both in this country, the UK and in France, now after the Charlie Hebdo and the, the Jewish supermarket killings, they are actually moving in that direction to uh, something like Salafism, to crim criminalize extremism, which is not violent, but it's only rhetorical or on the net. And so we're moving in that direction increasingly on the assumption that what happens on the net, the, the rhetorical, uh, actually then does transfer into the violent, uh, which is clearly a danger in a, in a liberal society. You then come into the whole question of how far does a liberal society have to be illiberal mm -hmm. to preserve liberalism? And that's the stage, stage in which I think most of our societies in, in Europe 
Oh, no. So, you're next. Um, two questions. Do you think that Brevik has read your book? Um, and also, do you think that someone like him, a mass murderer, has the right to have publicity with an interview or with a projection on the social media, given, as we know, inspiration comes from such source material? Mm. Uh, he has read the book um, and he hates it. Uh, I know that because, well, when I, I remember it was a strange thing. When I wrote the book at some point, I was so angry and I was thinking, he should th read this when I wrote about, you know, the teenagers, like he killed these people without knowing them. Uh, an example of the anger was, he's, why did he do it? He said in court, I did it to save Norwegian culture. There's one of the girls he kills. She is from the western part of Norway. She's playing a violin, and it's a very special violin. It's like a, it's one special uh, mm, version of the mm, Harding uh, violin, like very few people know. She was so talented. She got a scholarship to to learn that very specific Nash folklore music. She was killed. She was 19, um, and it's like she was, you know, really. She was, she was Norwegian culture, and he's doing this to save Norwegian culture. So it's like I wrote this with an anger and thinking, he should read this. He should know who he killed. And once the book was done, um, I was like, the last thing I'd ever wanted was to have his, you know, his fingers. He was just like, mm, you know, what they did that pushed the, pulled the trigger and all that. I said, like, last thing in the world, I wanted him to even look at those pages. So I never sent the book, and then I got a letter from prison, dear. Uh, Miss Aristot, could you please send me a copy of your book? <laughs> and I was like, okay, we just sent a book to his, to his lawyer and then he passed it on. And then now there were some scholars meeting him uh, and um, he said, the condition uh, I set that you don't mention this book and not my name. Uh, like my name. So that's, I took that, okay, that must mean, they told me afterwards, that must mean he's read it and it's touched something that he doesn't want to be uh, exposed. Um, because he's not, after all, portrayed as the political ideologue that he uh, So the next question, um, I think that, and this is a question for the press, because uh, he's allowed to give interviews. Uh, for, for the moment, he does not want to. But what when he does want? And when can he, can he then appear on a TV interview? I was Th thinking... That would be legally possible. That it, at, at least as it's, as it's so now, yes. But it hasn't been tested. But by now, no uh, Norwegian or international state, state stations have wanted to interview him. Because it's like, <laughs> it is, you know, it's... Um, it's just beyond. But then, is it then different in a book? Well, as I asked for an interview, I felt it was. Like, in a book like, like this, where I'm going through his life, in it's not possible for a journalist not asking him for an interview. It's fair, it, no. it would not be right. Um, but I think, in a book, if you expose him, uh, I think uh, it, you know, I don't think he would have, come out as a hero, um, but um, I think I've spoken to some journalists in, you know, in the tabloids in Norway, you know, would there be a time when, and they say probably there will, there will be a time where yeah. someone asks for an interview and or asks for the interview because they're afraid that the, the competitor will get it. But I think it's too early. And I don't think, he, he does, he's not able to inspire. I don't think that it will, it's not that one interview. Like he's out there. There's so many YouTube clips by him, with him. It's enough. It's like, what new does he have to say? Nothing. My question is slightly irrelevant, but I'm not sure who else I can ask it to. Um, is it possible for him to start a political party while in prison? <laughs> <laughs> it is it's actually interesting you ask. That is what he's doing now. He is, those scholars that I told you about that met him, um, they, he's now sitting in his cell and he's constructing the National Fascist 
party of Norway. Uh, that's the name of it. Uh, and he's like there with, the, you know, the leader, how he should be elected, the board, how he should be elected. It's like all this, he's, since he was a, you know, graffiti artist, tagger in his teens, he was crazy with making systems yeah. and maps and, and attack plans. And so he has that organization, uh, I don't know, skills because, uh, but, but he's, he's interested in it. So he's like making this party. Um, he's by now the only member of it. And we haven't, uh, and problem that we won't start now, but we haven't talked about his parents yet. But, mm. uh, and I won't, it's all in the book, but that, uh, just one thing about the father, because that happened after the book. So, um, the father, whom he hasn't seen since he was 15, uh, and I think who is quite important, even though he's hardly mentioned, is that uh, when he was 15, he was a tiger, and the father told him, uh, if you do this again, if you, if you, arrested by the police when he was 15. I will never see you again. And he was arrested again. And the father kept his words. He never saw the son from 15. And then on the 23rd of July, he's in, pa in France with his fourth wife. And he's called up by the press and he's asked about, you know, and he says, this is nothing to do with me. I haven't seen him since I was 15. Old people, uh, like, when, when he was younger, like he wished his, his father would be in contact. He wished his father would see, uh, would see him. And he also said, if I did one day something really great, maybe my father would see me. But then after this, after the book and everything, uh, the father contacts his son. And the son, and he wants to see him in prison. And Anders is responding uh, by letter, I will see you if you become the second member of my party. <laughs> and then he doesn't. He doesn't. Uh, so he's father. not. They've not met. The he didn't see him. Uh, he's not seen him yet. Yeah, the father is a diplomat. Uh, he, he was a former now. diplomat. Yeah. He's not, not Yeah. But um, I think it's a like revenge. Uh, I'm not a perfect. But there is. There's a definite revenge. There's so many. This the relationship to his mother and to his father is very important. Um, I want just to come back to the. Um, you said before that, um, like ISIS, for example, or, or and him, they have like a lot of similarities. I mean, in his manifesto and the plans he's doing. Um, I just wonder if you would think that maybe European society failed declaring him as a terrorist because he's. I think he's not really named as a terrorist. It's just one individual, but he has like the same. How would I say it? I mean, he's doing the, he's did exactly the same what terrorists are doing. So why, why not? Why is he not declared like this? Mm. Is it because he's a white Christian? Well, I would, every time um, I get that question, he is a political terrorist. And I agree with you. It should be stated again and again. Uh, and I think that is, um, um, in Norway, they, of course, when we didn't know, is he sane or not? It wasn't clear. Uh, but I felt, you know, once we could declare him mad, meaning sick, it declared us as healthy in a way, you know, he's sick, nothing to do with us. Um, but the fact that he is a terrorist, he's a political terrorist, is also like, how did, we can't just, uh, we can't just blame, you know, his, his illness, but it's like, does it have anything to do with our society? He didn't grow up in a vacuum after all. He is, uh, you know, we should see, we should take the, uh, it would not have been possible without the political context that he uh, killed for. Like, he needed that background. And I've sometimes I've seen uh, on Twitter, for instance, people discussing my book, and I um, that been Muslims who, let's say I've said in an interview, there's a headline about his childhood. And they would come out directly like, of course, she says, this, oh, of course, it's about uh, his childhood. Uh, and he's a Christian uh, point. And I always then respond immediately, no, he's a political terrorist. I've always said that. I've always meant that. So it's like, um, uh, yes, we do, we put more, we, like, probably we don't ask, too often to the jihadists. So what was it in your childhood? And just like one, one, one about that, if you, if you read the childhood about the, these four French uh, terrorists in uh, the two Charlie Hebdo killers and, and then the, 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 the guy in the kosher shop and the girlfriend, they're also 
in and out of orphanages, in and out of foster care. They have a terrible childhood. And those two Kwachi brothers, their childhood is image, uh, like a mirror image of Breivik. Like they grow up with a single mother and the social services want to take the kids away from her, just as they wanted to take Anders away from the mother. Um, the social services ended, ends up uh, because she doesn't want to give the children away, just like Anders' mo mother didn't want to give him away. They take three. They leave her with two and which are those two. She becomes a prostitute just as Breivik's mother is being like the neighbors thought she was a prostitute because there were so many men coming and going to her flat and there's uh, um, so they're all exposed to things they shouldn't uh, know as children. Then those two Koachi brothers, they find their mother having committed suicide when they're 10 and 12. Then they're placed in an orphanage and in foster care. And then we say they were radicalized by the Iraq war, by the caricatures of Muhammad, by the atrocities in Abu Ghraib and so on. I was like, but what made them fertile ground for those ideas? Does it have something to do with their very miserable upbringing in these French suburbs? And, and the same in Breivik's case, which we have asked over and over again. We ask what's wrong with his past, but we don't really ask those jihadists what was in their childhood. So I think that's so important that to look, look, look into what made it possible to kill. What was broken in this, maybe early on, to be able to kill so cold-bloodedly? So these are questions for, you know, for, for scholars and researchers and psychiatrists. And, uh, but I think maybe uh, in, uh, when you look at violent criminals, the research has been done. Uh, we, you know, murderers and so on. So uh, more up to like, you know, almost like 100% of them have a so-called bad childhood. Meaning if you have a bad childhood, it doesn't make you into a violent criminal or a terrorist. But if you are a violent criminal and a murderer and a terrorist, you are very likely to have had a bad childhood. So it's like at some point they were, you know, they were, uh, something is broken at some point, and I think that's important to look at. You know, again, again, we come back to the same thing, really, Osna, that, 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 that jihadists and terrorists of every kind, um, the terrorists with which UK was, was familiar in the 70s and 80s, the, the uh, IRA and so on, every kind of terrorist organization uh, is an organization. There are a whole number of people. There's a context. With it. There's a cause. Mm. Irish freedom, um, the liberation for Chechnya, whatever it might be. And yet he was alone. That's, mm. that's, you come back again and again to he did not have anybody but himself. He created this world, this universe in which he, as you, as you said, he was the leader of the party, the president, the prime minister, the, the foreign he was everything. And he was everything to himself. That was the difference, I think. And it was a kind of an extreme, extreme form of, of narcissism, which is rarely seen before. And that's what your, your book brings out. We've got time for a few more questions. Anybody else want to come in? Uh, before we, please. <coughs> Um, from the perspective of the families or the Norwegian people, do you get the impression they feel that justice was done with the sentence that was given, or is there something that would make them feel more that justice was had mm. in this case? Well, I think that for most of the parents, uh, I think justice. Of course, it's not possible, but justice has been done when it comes to the, his sentence. Because, of course, there would be some parents who would talk, you know, about the death sentence or other people. But then again, for most parents, and that's all about, it's like, we're not going to change Norway because of him. We're not going to change everything. So if we then impose the death penalty, which, of course, it, it, that would have been out of the question, of course, uh, politically for Norway. Um, but other than 
changes. Um, it would show that you know uh, we we have to stand by our values. Uh, that's the remember. That also, many of these parents are Labour Party parents. It's not a random collected group of parents. Um, the kids who were killed are among. Uh, it's probably wrong to say the brightest, you know, but when you see them as a group, very enthusiastic, very hard work working, they choose to spend their summer holiday on a political workshop. It's like many of them come from uh, political oriented families. So it's like um, people who, even in the depth of the deepest sorrow and grief and lo uh, loss, uh, they are. I see them as quite principled and, and, uh, and um, it was important for them to be that he was declared sane actually uh, for most of them when I say they I mean most of them um, because again if he'd been declared insane he would have gotten treatment and a very much more difficult and he it would just been um, less clear and I think for many people who have lost someone, they want a definite sentence and that's it, over it, we want to forget him uh, and go, go on. Uh, yeah, that is like, I think that's the, uh, the general picture. Anyone want to come in with the last one? If so not, can I just pick yeah, up on what please. gentleman here said? said that there's only one thing worse than being talked about and that's not being talked mm. about and I sort of wonder maybe he hated your book but at least he's still out there mm. I'm not criticizing you for writing a book obviously mm. but I just sort of wonder if that ultimately is a problem actually wouldn't it be better if everybody just ignored him but uh, that's not how the wor world works and it was also lots of discussions like you know lots of groups saying let's not use his name let's call him the killer or something and it's also it's not possible in the real world his name is uh in norway we use th these three names anders bearing breivik here he's using these two names um and so that's just that's not how the world is uh, then i think that if you try this you know don't mention it don't do it he would be become so much more interesting for 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 other groups so uh, groups so i think it's it's important to, to, I think, if you, that's why it's also, as you mentioned, it's so concrete and, and detailed. Like, what starts rumors and cons conspiracies and, and things like that? It's like, if we don't have the full picture, if there's a chunk lacking, mm, was he actually alone? Did he have helpers? You know, it's like, the more detailed it is, we have, we have documented every single minute on that island for instance or his preparations and what happened during court uh, less speculations and rumors and conspiracies <laughs> and, and the final question i can also just like end up with um uh what, what um think about the book because it's um i've got like everyone read through their parts uh, and of course the most painful parts to send to parents was those parts where I've written maybe only a couple of lines, but just as their child is being killed. And none of them changed or took away anything. And there was one mother who, actually I was not in contact with because her daughter is not mentioned by name in the book. And, and she wrote to me and she said, um, I struggled my way through the book, um, took me some time, and I've decided that I now see it as a declaration of love towards my daughter Sinna and to the other victims uh, and that was very important for me uh, and I've gotten other letters like that from mothers and fathers that they see the book in that context and that that's important to me okay so that is what comes across uh, because it is also a book about belonging and it is a book about love uh, in the way I describe these young people. Um, so um, that is, of course, in the press, uh, not the main points, because there are other points that are you know, more, you know, easier to talk about. But it's, um, that is very important to also portray not only why did he end up on the island,
Why did these young people end up on the island? What was their political awakening? Why did they decide to, you know, how, how, how come they were, you know, who were they? And to kind of give them some kind of a, a memory of who they were too. Since uh, this is um, a club for journalists, I know you're not all journalists, but it was founded with that idea. I won't, uh, I'll end with a commercial, um, not just for Osni Sayastad's latest extraordinary book, but also for journalism. It's in crisis, especially my trade and what had been your trade, newspapers. So it's now, um, it's not come out of that crisis and may never, never come out of the crisis. Things that journalism does clearly is, is to tell stories. That's how we journalists put across what we're trying to put across usually. Even in the Financial Times, we tell stories um, to make people aware of what's happening in the world. It's one way of doing it. And uh, Syostad's books, um, not just this one, but from the books that are of Kabul through to this one, have told stories which have illuminated some part of human life, very often in extremes. Indeed, you are an extremist yourself. <laughs> you're an ex uh, a writer about extremists. And as you were saying to me earlier, you're now writing about, about people who leave Norway, as many have left this country and others in Europe to go to fight to, or to marry fighters in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere. And we need these stories. And the greatest, I think, hope for the, for the continuation of journalism is that, that people will still need to understand the world through narratives. And you have been lucky today, this evening, excuse me, to have a great storyteller. So many thanks. Thank you.